The purpose of this video is to provide some context for learning about geology. For engineers to successfully interact with this fascinating subject, they must enter a relationship of mutual respect and understanding with the supporting material. We have really only one demand of the ground, and that is that it safely supports our buildings and does so without excessive movement. To successfully do this, we need to know two things. One, how the soil got there, and two, what is the soil type? In the first, we will be able to get insights on the soil's formation, and from the second, how the soil will respond when loaded. Let's start our journey by briefly looking at the history of the Earth, paying particular attention to the past two million years, as these have had a profound effect on the near-surface material, and thus, how we design our buildings to successfully interact with them. Looking at the Earth's structure, it comprises a series of spherical shells, much like an onion. This can be broken down into four distinct layers, the inner core, outer core, mantle and crust. Intense radioactive heat from the Earth's core causes the molten magma to rotate in convection currents and the floating crust to experience stretching and compression forces that drive the movements of the Earth's surface. Evidence of this has been found by geologists monitoring the crust's movement. For example, it has been found that Ireland is moving at a rate of 4 centimetres further away from New York every year. The Earth's crust, being brittle, breaks into a series of plates. These are known as tectonic plates. There are seven or eight major plates, depending how they are defined. Plates moving towards each other collide and result in either upward movement forming mountains, or one plate may dive beneath the other and form what's known as a subduction zone. Conversely, when the crust splits and moves apart, we get the release of molten magma and the formation of new crust, similar to what's currently happening along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. As a result of this, earthquakes and intense volcanic activity occur along these boundaries, known as the Ring of Fire. So why do we need to know all this? It is the Earth's crust that provides a reservoir of materials we use to construct the buildings, bridges and sculptures we see in everyday life. For example, the igneous or fireborne rocks of granite or basalt make excellent aggregate for concrete manufacture, while the sedimentary deposits are used to manufacture cement. They also give us a history literally written in stone, as the fossils deposited layer upon layer in a water environment were subsequently examined by the paleontologists and thus give us the story of the evolution of modern day man. Of course, nothing stays the same and these rocks in turn are subjected to different metamorphic processes which, for example, turns limestone into beautiful ornate marble which clad so many of our buildings today. These rocks are exposed to a diverse and aggressive environment of wind, water and ice which constantly erodes and transports the rock, turning it into a blanket of soil that supports so many of our buildings. For example, granite breaks down to give us clays, while sandstone, surprise surprise, decomposes to sand. Interestingly, transportation is not always at the heart of all erosion processes. In fact, over 50% of the earth soils are formed by the parent rock decomposing in place. However, in this part of the world, it is soil formation through erosion and the subsequent redeposition that dominates the engineering challenges we face today. Let's look at this in a little more detail. Over the past two million years, the Earth has experienced alternating periods of warming and cooling. When the Earth's surface cools, for example, much of the water is taken up in ice, forming glaciers. As these move over the land, encouraged by the forces of gravity, they plunder and ravage the soil and rock surface that lies beneath, creating new soil and subsequently depositing it elsewhere. For example, 
when the weight of material carried by the glacier becomes excessive. It is either just dumped or, in the case of subglacial river flows, is deposited in a distinct layering process. Let's look at how glaciation has affected the type of foundation required to support a building. As the glacier moves across the land, its weight compresses the material that lies beneath. In time, during a warm phase in the Earth's history, the glacier starts to melt and retreats, leaving behind a highly compressed and strong soil deposit. The compressed soils are known as overconsolidated soils. This means they have experienced a load at some time in their past that is greater than the load it currently experiences. This is good news for the engineer. It means we can now design a structure that will be safely supported on the ground and will undergo only minimal movements if its weight does not exceed the maximum historical load. Overconsolidated soils can form in other ways. For example, we spoke earlier about the formation of sedimentary deposits. These primarily take place under water. Imagine, if you will, soil been deposited layer upon layer on the seabed, and after millions of years of layer building, tectonic forces or glacial retreat causes the soil to be elevated above sea level, and thus exposing it to the ravages of the erosion processes once more. As soil is progressively removed, an element at depth experiences unloading similar to glacial retreat, but at a much slower rate. The net effect of this again is the creation of an overconsolidated soil. As glacial retreat takes place, the remaining soils are released as loose outwash sands and gravels, which are deposited on top of the overconsolidated materials. These water flows end up creating rivers that run through valleys and these in turn are a source of further erosion. They cut down through the soils and rocks carrying the material to be redeposited at some other location. So we can see that either outwash gravels from the glacier or river deposited material give us a new type of soil. A soil that has not been compressed but instead is soft and weak. These types of soils we refer to as normally consolidated soils. We have to pay particular attention when we construct buildings on these soils. Because of their soft nature, they are vulnerable to failing and indeed it is likely that we will experience significant ground movements. We can conclude that it is imperative for the engineer to have a basic understanding of the fundamentals of geology and how this can influence the type of soil at a particular location and its likely response when built upon. Click here to continue with the next video.